welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My name is Andy, sometimes Mouse, and I talk about books and book-related things. Today I am giving you my February wrap-up. I do want to give my regular disclaimers that if you hear any um, random sounds, animals eating, drinking water, beeping, barking, etc. I do live in a zoo and I don't have any control over what those animals, what the sounds they might be making. I wonder if people think I actually live in a zoo. Anyway, February was an interesting month. There were a lot of flops and a lot of misses. Didn't expect that. But anyway, we keep on as we, as you do. I was a little bit worried that reading so much with my eyes this month was going to give me a little bit of a reading slump. I don't know if it did, but I do feel hesitant now about picking up a book that I have to read with my eyes. I'll get into that a little bit more about like what I mean by how that may have affected me. And I think when I just explain the page lengths of some of those books, it'll make more sense. Let's go ahead and get into it though. The stats are as follows. I read 37 books. I read 5,106 pages. I listened to 162 hours and 52 minutes worth of audiobooks, which is about six days. My average pages per day was 135.1. My average hours per day listened was six hours, 17 minutes, and 49 seconds. I acquired two books and spent a total of $32.46. One is a pre-order that won't come in until next month, I believe, so I don't know if that counts. I read uh, 20 library books, and uh, so 20 of the 37 books that I read were library books, and 11 of them were rereads. Of those books, my average rating was a 3.8, which is not very high. It was not a good month, like I said, for reading. There were a lot of disappointments this month. Then I read 18 audiobooks, 10 ebooks, and 9 physical books. Of those books, their page lengths are as follows. Nine of them were between 101 and 200 pages. Three of them were between 201 and 300 pages. Four of them were between 301 and 400 pages. One was between 401 and 500 pages. One was between 501 and 600 pages. And one was over 700 pages. As you can see, I did read a few very long books, and I think that in doing so, I kind of, I should have spread those out a little bit more. I should have, like, put them maybe more in the next, like, in, in March rather than in February, but I didn't do that, and I think that it did affect how much I enjoyed some of those books, because not only did I set myself up not for great success by having all of them in February, but I also, the way I planned them was to read them all back to back, which I think really set me up for failure. I do want to disclaim that I am only counting the books that I did have to at some points read with my eyes. So some of them I may have read with audiobooks sometimes, like the Spiderwood Chronicles, or I just predominantly read them with my eyes or visually reading. I don't know the right way to describe that. But those are just the ones that I'm counting and how I'm counting them. So, you know, transparency. Of those books, I read 17 adult books, 13 middle grade books, and 7 young adult books. So I'm still on a good trend of reading predominantly adult books over anything else. It is kind of like, I guess, more like 50-50 between adult and middle grade. So I don't really know how that is playing into my goal of reading books more aligned to my age group. But, um, you know, middle grade is just a nice little break. Um, that is going to change, obviously, because my childhood rereads series is coming to an end. It ended in February. I read the last of my childhood rereads that I plan on reading. Um, I might read the Ellen Hopkins books, but I have not decided on that yet. And I don't know if I'll dedicate a video to it. For genres, I will be showing you my book blanket as I talk about the different genres that I read and their numbers. I think that that will link that a little bit better. I read 18 fantasy, 4 thriller, 4 horror, 4 contemporary, 3 romance, 3 sci-fi, and 1 historical. That obviously gives me a total of 37 rows done for my book blanket. I did end my book blanket with the moss stitch just like I did in the previous month to give me a better indicator of how to better differentiate between the month changes. Additionally, I somehow overextended on one end and so it is no longer perfectly aligned, but the other end is. I don't know how I did that and I'm not going to fix it. So I am just going to continue upwards from there and, you know, call it a day. Eventually it'll just look like January is weirdly shorter than the rest of the months. 
I have also worked on this blanket for 19 hours and 24 minutes and it has a total of 83 rows if you include January and February together. The blanket is now 18.9 inches wide, which is 48 centimeters. And again, it is long enough to cover up a blanket. That's the rundown of the genres and all of that. So my top five books this month, um, two of them are in the same series and I don't feel bad about it. I'm just giving that disclaimer. <laughs> and one of them was a reread. Again, I don't feel bad about it. The number one book this month Normally they're not in any order, but actually looking at this list, I'm going to say it's, it's probably number one. It's going to be Malice by Heather Walter. I read Malice last year. It is the sapphic retelling of Sleeping Beauty. I, I'm obsessed with this book. I love that our main character is trying her best, but also is evil, but for a good reason, which is very much the story of Maleficent and we know that right we know that she was shunned and shamed and deserved better and I love that there's this trend of showing that side of things I really have enjoyed this book I I can't it's one of those books that I enjoyed so much that I have a very hard time describing why it was so good I'm just like no you just need to read it it was good you just need you just need to read it I think another thing that I really like about it is that it's kind of right on the cusp between YA and adult it is an adult book but I think that it's again right on the cusp and the second book definitely falls for more into the adult category it has some YA elements but because of the political sides of it and the political complexities of it I think that that would make it fall into the adult category but I'll get into that in a little bit malice though is a fantastic opening honestly if it could have just ended like malice could be a standalone book and it still would be a five-star read for me I appreciate the character uh, interpersonal relationships and what I also appreciate and I've talked about this in other book reviews I love when a character's core self maintains like their core goal their core who they are as a person stays the same and if even if romance is involved who they are as a person still stays the same so in this book specifically Alice wants to know more about her background, her history, her magic, wants to be more powerful and wants to be treated as an equal to the races. And even though she is in love with Aurora and thinks Aurora is fantastic and great, she doesn't necessarily lose that inherent goal of wanting to find that information out. And yes, some decisions are made that are blinded by romance, but I think that would happen to anybody. But there still is that inherent goal of finding more information out about her past. And I think that her staying with that mindset and her staying with her core self is what makes me love this book so much. There are there's a healthy balance of things that are kind of amusing and lighthearted, a healthy balance of romance to dark things and political intrigue and I think that Heather Walter did an amazing smashing job for a first book in a duology here because again it could stand on its own and I think that that's something that duologies miss a lot is that they cannot stand on their own at all and that hinders them. The next one is The Last Quintista by Donna Barba Higuera. This is a middle grade. I stand by the fact that I don't think it should be a middle grade. I know I flip-flopped on that a little bit, but I'm gonna hold to my original statement that it shouldn't be a middle grade just because it's incredibly dark. It is incredibly dark. The Last Quintista, our main character, is put on a ship where she's supposed to go to sleep for a really long time, but then it turns out that this ship has been taken over by people whose opinion about equality is to make everybody look the same, which is eugenics. Um, I don't know if I can say that word on, on here. Anyway, I, I loved this book. It had me by the heartstrings. It was an interesting sci-fi without being overtly complicated. Sometimes sci-fi starts to feel a little bit too mathy and too sciencey for me. And I just, I, I'm like, oh, I'm too dumb for this. Thank you though. And the focus wasn't necessarily on space itself, but the focus was on saving all of the people from Earth that have been sleeping on the ship that has been taken over by this group of people that definitely don't have the actual opinions that the people who built the ship did. And it has conversations about privilege and being rich and how sometimes um, not very well off scientists and that kind of thing get to go on these kinds of trips or get to have these kinds of privileges only because it benefits the rich and it's just it's a really complex and interesting story while also tying in lore and myth from our main character's culture which I thought was really interesting and her the way that she's breaking the mind control-esque 
stuff that's going on is by telling these stories and is by sharing this myth and lore and is by reminding people of the world from back home, which is what the point of verbal storytelling is, is to share these stories to remind people of the heritage that they come from and the moral lessons that their ancestors have learned. And we can learn from them and then grow from them, which is kind of the gist of the book. And I think that this story did a fantastic job of explaining itself and representing all of these different concepts while also making you feel emotionally attached to our main character. I also have to say at one point she mentions something about it being so sad that one of the characters has never had talkies in their life. And that made me laugh because that is something that my best friend would think. She loves Takis. A lot of people from here love Takis. I don't, they're too spicy for me. I'm a baby. But I thought that was hilarious. I immediately went downstairs and was like, Bella. This this 12 year old said that life is like basically not worth living if you haven't had Takis before. Just so you know, you've been represented. <laughs> then we have Both Can Be True by Jules Macias. This is another middle grade. I want to give a massive trigger warning for this book though because I was listening to this book while um, spooling yarn and I got super triggered and had to stop the book and take a minute to breathe because I was starting to panic. And that's never happened to me before. So I want to go ahead and give a trigger warning because I'm going to talk about what happened that was so hard for me. Um, I will give a notification that I'm going to talk about that and then when I finish talking about that. I've got some other things that I need, need to build up before I can tell you about it, but I just want to give that warning because if you are non-binary or gender fluid, it could be um, harmful to you or exploring gender at all it could feel harmful to you this book follows two main characters ash who is gender fluid and has never really felt attached to one gender or the other and daniel who feels as though he is overly emotional and therefore is not mature or manly etc etc and can't be taken seriously because of it if my camera seems like it's in a different place it's because my camera just died anyway <laughs> Daniel feels like he can't be masculine or mature because of his the way his family treats his being overly emotional. And essentially Daniel rescues this dog that he, you know, his parent, his mom won't let him have and then he um, loops in Ash to help him with taking care of this dog and then said dog runs away. So this Ash being gender fluid was really interesting to me because I've never seen that represented in such a way in a middle grade contemporary. And I felt like this book did a fantastic job of representing it and I don't want to say that it didn't do a fantastic job. This book made me cry. It is obviously one of my top books of February. I enjoyed it a ton. However, this is where things got a little bit triggering for me. Ash's father is one of those liberals who thinks that they are inclusive and not transphobic um, because he supports trans people and supports them in their um, transitioning from one gender to the other. However, he does not support the gender fluidity between the two and between the two ends of the spectrum. And he's having dinner with Ash and in that conversation he essentially says, you know, you you need to pick. You can't just flip-flop between uh, the two. It's incredibly confusing. You can't just flip-flop. Um, you have to pick. And even if you don't pick, when you feel more like a boy, then you need to act like a boy. Like, boys don't go out and do this, and boys don't wear pink, and boys don't do that. Like, it, you need to act like a boy. Or when you feel like being a girl, then you need to act like a girl, and you need to fit into these, these cishet boxes because it makes things easier for everyone else. It makes it easier for everyone else and their their expectations and their understanding of what gender is because even if you're fluid which is already confusing then you need to pick a side like you need to represent the gender correctly and it i was listening to it and like i started panicking like i've never uh, normally i can stop something before i realize that like before it really genuinely triggers me but i'm just spooling my yarn and listening and I'm all of a sudden notice that I'm not breathing <laughs> because I'm panicking so badly and so I have to pause it take a moment and calm down explain why I was feeling so triggered but it was just really it was really har harmful for, for me because it's something that I've personally been um, going through and not going through nobody said those words to me this is just my own personal internal conversation and arguments that I have with myself um, I guess that this is more Basically, I struggle with the fact that I don't identify really as any gender and 
so sometimes I want to look masculine but I also want to wear pink makeup and so then am I still looking masculine and it's a very confusing internal conversation that I have to have regularly not have to but that I end up having regularly um, and so I think that's why it was additionally triggering for me just because it's something that I'm currently processing in my own mind um, anyway end of trigger warning for real this time I promise but it was genuinely one of the best books I've ever read. The way that it represented gender fluidity was fantastic. The way that it also represented the problems that cis men go through um, emotionally and how our society does not support them being emotional and does not support them being loving and caring and does not want them to be those people and those expectations. I really appreciated the fact that it addressed all of those things. It also addressed, you know, the confusion not really confusion, I feel like that's a bad word because it sounds negative and I don't mean it in a negative way, but Daniel and Ash do eventually become a romantic pairing and Daniel does not identify as queer, but Daniel then likes Ash and Ash sometimes represents being a boy and sometimes represents being a girl and sometimes is somewhere in the middle. And so then Daniel has this kind of, there is a conversation of, of where Daniel's like, I don't really know, but I like you. And I think that that is a fantastic conversation to be had, especially at the age group that this is intended for, because this is something that's happening. Like this is something that that age group is experiencing. And I think that it's incredibly important to make sure that they have the languaging or an understanding of what that experience might look like. So sorry, I could talk about that book for a really long time. It was just an incredible book and I enjoyed it a lot. Then we have a very, very big difference in book entirely. <laughs> Vicious by V.E. Schwab. This came out forever ago. Art told me to read it though. I didn't, it, I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't this. It wasn't this. Having read uh, V.E. Schwab's other books and really liking Addie LaRue, but only kind of liking the Shades of Magic books. Don't look at my reviews on Goodreads because I reviewed it back when I didn't know how to review things. I, I didn't expect this. In the book, our main characters are trying to create extra ordinary humans, which are basically humans with some kind of superpower, essentially. And one, uh, one of them, sorry, I can't think of names right now. We be going through it memory wise. Eli? Elliot? Something? He has religious trauma, becomes an extraordinary, and then uses to like, be, returns to being extra religious and wants to get rid of all of the extraordinaries because they're kind of an abomination, even though he's an extraordinary now. And his sidekick, kick bestie Victor question mark I believe that's his name also becomes an extraordinary and is out to kill him holy shit this book was good this book was good it pinged all of my really really specific interests of like religious trauma and little batty girlfriends and and superheroes with powers that you wouldn't really necessarily think of and I do love V.E. Schwab's writing period point blank even in Shades of Magic I can say that I loved the writing I just don't love the story so I think that V.E. Schwab is a fantastic author and I am really excited to read more books from that set I know that there's like a prequel that's like 10 pages long or something and then a, a sequel I think Vengeful I believe is what it's called and I have that on hold of the library so very exciting. Now then for the next, the last uh, of my top five books in February, it's an arc so at least I stuck to that, um, and that is gonna be Misrule by Heather Walter. Yes that is the sequel to Malice. Now y'all have probably heard me talk about in either vlogs or on Twitter how sequels in the last year have traumatized me and I have PTSD so I can make jokes like that. They have I hate I have hated so many sequels recently they have been incredibly disappointing or just not quite it or clearly just a bridge between one book and the other why did you make this a trilogy it should have been a duology that kind of energy Miss Roll home run a home run hit a fucking fantastic Atlas is still Alice so a hundred years has passed Alice has taken over Briar Aurora is still asleep whatever a hundred years has passed Alice has aged, obviously, like aged in maturity levels. You know, she's a mistress trying to defeat all of the other fairy kingdoms. So like, obviously she's aged in this war and trying to win it. But 
she's still Alice. Like at her core self, she's still Alice. She still loves Aurora and it's still this story. The story did not take the turn I expected it to. It did not go the way I expected it to. I don't know what I really expected, but I didn't expect this book. However, I still got fantastic world building, amazing plot, fantastic characters. The little imps, the imps in this book are hilarious. I want one. The whole time I was, Art and I buddy read this, but I would be ahead of Art at some points and I would be like, I would die for the imps. They're horrible, but I would die for them and I adore them. And everything that they say, say and stand for, they're hilarious and I love them. It really gave a humorous side of this story that was kind of needed to lighten it a little bit because a lot was happening. Um, there's a lot of political intrigue like I had mentioned prior and there's a lot of political complexities and a lot of things that you might need to remember which is expected in an adult book like this. However, at no point was I like, Jesus Christ, this should have been a trilogy and not a duology because that's something that happens. I am going to record my sequel syndrome video. I have scripted it already. I'm actually gonna do it and not just talk about it so don't worry about it. But this is something that happens with sequels where either they should have not existed or they should have been a trilogy and not a duology. This was not the case. This was the perfect balance and genuinely if this book did not semi rely on you having remembered the characters from the previous book and those events, this book could stand on its own as a fantastic fucking book. Like on its own, it's a fantastic book. Putting it in the duology makes it even better. And it was amazing. I adored this book and I am so glad that I finally had a sequel that I can rant and rave home about. So yeah, that's my top five books for the month amazing honestly amazing books i read a lot of diverse books now that i'm no longer tracking di diversity i've noticed that i'm just inherently reading a lot more diversely i don't i don't know how that works a lot of fantastic stories that showed a lot of different representation and i just enjoyed all of it so much this month the ones that were good the ones that were good were really good the ones that were bad were really fucking bad then we have the worst book of the month i straight up did not even want to log this in Goodreads. I want to pretend I never picked it up. I want to pretend I don't didn't read it. I want to pretend that it never entered my brain. And that is going to be The Husbands by May Cobb. Now, The Husbands premise sounds exactly like my shit. These women are in a hunting club. Not The Husbands. Why did I say The Husbands? What am I doing? Why did I, I keep doing that too. It's The Hunting Wives. I fucking loved The Husbands. I have it over there. Best, but so good. Loved The Husbands. The Hunting Wives by May Cobb. These wives are in a hunting club. They don't really hunt, they just go shooting. So I don't know why it's called the hunting wives. Anyway, they don't, they don't hunt. Well, I mean, we'll get into it. They just go shooting, mostly. And they're all rich, rich and super privileged in East Texas. So I'm gonna say, I think Dallas, isn't that in the East Texas? Dallas-Fort Worth area? I believe that's in East Texas. That don't, no one who's from there come for me if I'm wrong. I can't, I don't know maps. I, they're all well off. They're rich. They generally have the ideal life, like fantastic lives. Now, everybody knows in rich people drama that they inherently, like in rich people lives, if you've ever watched Real Housewives, right, or anything else, rich people get bored easily because they don't have anything challenging them. And so they inherently create the drama for themselves. This book is no exception. This did feel like if I was watching The Real Housewives of Dallas, though, except it felt like if I was watching The Real Housewives of Dallas, um, and they didn't edit out every single one of Brandy's inane thoughts. And I said this in a vlog and I stand by it. Our main character in this book, I don't give a fuck about every single time that she needs to make a latte, every single time that she gets wasted, every single, I, I don't care. I don't, I just, I don't care. I, bad, it was incredibly bad. They are doing all of these things and when they go quote unquote hunting, what they're doing is going to a bar and seducing someone and one of our main characters like the the main focus lady not sophie sophie's our main character but she goes she's obsessed with margot liking her and margot margot likes to sleep with high school boys specifically one of her best friend's sons the most of this is addressed as inappropriate is a little like snippet about the age of consent in the state of Texas being 17, which it is. And we also have Romeo and Juliet laws, which that's for people who are like 16 and 19, those kind of ages. I, this is, so that's what they do when they go hunting. They seduce men and for Margot specifically, she seduces boys, children. She seduces children to cheat on her husband. 
Sophie has everything she could want. Her husband is amazing. He's incredibly kind. I have never read a book about a straight white man and been like, yeah, I think he's sweet and he deserves rights until this one. Uh, she has a, a beautiful, fantastic son. She has the perfect job. She gets to do whatever she wants. They are well off. Uh, she has a great friend before she gets into this friend group. She has a fantastic life, but because she's bored with it, she decides to let it all go in flame. At about 60% of the book, where we have to listen to them talk about getting sauced, which by the way, I've never heard anyone in the state of Texas use that word to determine that they are wasted. Is this person who wrote this book from Texas? Because I've literally never heard anybody use that word. The book is predominantly about them getting wasted and having these adventures and it, you know, her husband getting angrier and angrier at her as he should and her losing her friendship with her best friend as she should and her constantly becoming strangely obsessed with Margot. And then about 60% into the book, it turns, uh, they find out that Margot's little boy toy, the boyfriend, her, or his girlfriend, his high school age girlfriend, has been murdered. And it, uh, her body was found on the property of Margot, like where they go and shoot guns. And then Sophie is essentially framed for the murder. And I think she deserves it. And at some point, one of the detectives is like, you're blacked out constantly and your only alibi is a teenage boy that you were sleeping, that you were cheating on your husband with. Why would we trust you? Which honestly, I agree that I agree. I am in full agreement. Obviously I'm anti-prison, but I do, I agree. Why would the detective believe you when you constantly spent so much time cheating on your husband with a child and then getting blacked out wasted, frequently blacked out wasted, when you knew that these women were up to things that made you uncomfortable, made your husband uncomfortable. You continued to lie and waste your time and ruin your life. None of the characters in this book are likable except for obviously the husband and the son and then like the people that are getting hurt. They are stupid as fuck. And you know what? The twist was so, the twist was so stupid because no, it didn't add up to anything else. None of the other evidences that would have, um, pointed at someone like none of the evidence is pointed at this person and I know that's the point of a twist but I mean like none of it like the author just picked the name out of a hat and was like this is the one that's not how thrillers work this book was dead ass one of the worst books I've ever read it has taken the place of the silent patient as the worst thriller I've ever read and that's really disappointing because this one's written by a woman and at least the last the last silent patient was um written by a man and I can you know but be like men shouldn't write women which I mean they mostly shouldn't but you know maybe sometimes women shouldn't write women because this was a horrible book I don't recommend it to anyone and I think that you would all be better off never ever reading it ever the cover is not worth it trust me besties it's not worth it it's not just watch Real Housewives watch Real Housewives and alternate between watching Real Housewives and a true crime episode and you will get more thrill you will get more thrill because again the thriller part of this doesn't start until 60% in. It doesn't. It was a absolute waste of my time. I've never been so frustrated. I'm still frustrated. Like I'm thinking about it and I'm so frustrated. <sighs> anyway, that's my wrap up for the month. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry about that rant about the hunting wives and how much I hated it. But I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, um, don't forget to like and subscribe and share. I, I noticed that like 50% of you are watching my videos, but you're not subscribed. So if you could subscribe, that would be great. I would appreciate it a lot. Comment down below if you've read any of these or if you intend to read anything like Miss Roll when it comes out. You should read Miss Roll when it comes out. I think everyone should read Miss Roll when it comes out. Anyway, if you didn't enjoy this video, let me know also how I can make it better for you. Unless it's about my opinions. Those are subjective. Sorry. I'm gonna go. I will see you guys again next week. I post every Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. Central Standard. I have for about two years now, so yay for scheduling. Uh, don't forget to take care of yourselves, drink your water, and do something today to take care of yourselves. Okay, thanks. Bye.